Hello and welcome to the Analytics Show, the podcast of business through the lens of data science. But together, we'll dive into learning and sharing where various industries are heading and how data and analytics is at the heart of shaping business growth and productivity. Let's spark different ways of thinking about data and analytics that is relevant to you and prepare your business for future disruption. I'm your host, Jason Tan. I'm delighted you could make it on this journey with us. Hey guys, to continue to get support, tips, techniques, and tools, and learn from the expert, hit that subscribe button wherever you are so we can keep in touch and continue our lifelong learning together. So, are you using your company data to its full potential? Take our embedded analytic assessment, find out your score. A leading organization like Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google have moved beyond dashboard and embedded data science directly into their daily business operation. With our three-minute test, you will discover your potential in optimizing customer experience and revenue through embedded analytics. You will gain greater clarity, insight, and advice to embed analytics. Plus, you will receive customized results instantly. Find the link to this assessment in the description of this episode. Hi, Steve. Thank you so much for coming on to the Analytics Show. I'm super, super, super excited to have you here. And I tell you what, I have you to close the year by scheduling you to be the one appearing in the last episode of the year of 2020, an exciting year that we have had. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jason. I'm also super excited to be here. We're going to have an awesome chat and hopefully our audience will get something interesting out of it. I'm certainly they will. Now, I wanted to start by congratulating you as a finalist for LinkedIn Top Voice 2020. And that's really, really great and exciting news. Would you mind to share with uh, some of our listeners about that? Thanks, Jason. So, Yeah, you're right. I was also shocked and super happy when I received a message from LinkedIn that I'm finalist for Top Voice 2020. And the reason is because LinkedIn usually pick the top voice based on their engagement, but not the followers. And when you have more followers, it will negatively impact you. And that's very interesting. If you check all these people that usually get to the finals or or become the top voice that normally don't have more than 20 or 30K followers, because then it is a kind of uh, penalty if you get too many followers, but not many people engaging your post. And for me, after getting like 270K followers, I was like, there's no way for me to reach that number of engagement that will make me shortlisted for top voice. And when I received that, I was like, oh my God, it means that somehow people are engaging and liking my post that makes LinkedIn believe that it's a good ratio. So it was great. And the thing is for me, I'm not here to get any accolades. The most important the most important outcome for me on being on LinkedIn is just helping people and seeing that people get inspired and they get something out of my post that will help them to either more successful career or come up with a new idea or anything else that will help them through their life. Yeah, I can see that in a lot of your posts, I'm going to go into the details a little bit about that one later, but I have been following you quite a little while now, uh, Steve, and I have to say that the engagement from your follower and your audience on your post is actually really, really, really good. Not only about just the number in terms of that 270K and also the number of the engagement, but the other thing that I wanted to point out is that your type of the person in terms of the LinkedIn posting is you post multiple times a day. Now that actually really quite go against some of the rules that I know that many other LinkedIn coach are teaching. But yet, that multiple posts per day, five days a week, approximately, is still lending you that sort of engagement. 
I think it speaks for itself in terms of the quality of the contents. You're right. So I do post a couple of times a day. And the reason is just because there are many interesting innovations happening in the world. And I do want my audience to get the latest trends and news directly in the shortest time. So if I wait for something that has been released today, by tomorrow, I feel that I'm doing it the service for my audience. So that's definitely something that I'll try to do. But at the same time, I will try not to flood and spam the social media as much as I can. So there are two different ideas about how to engage and perform on LinkedIn. One is that like, don't flood, don't do a lot, maybe once or twice a day maximum, and that's it. The other end of the spectrum says, just do as much as you can. Even if you don't have any content, just stick something random in your post and send it out. If you get like two likes, 10 likes, doesn't matter. Just make sure that you are the only person available on social media and people can't even see anyone else in their social feed, no matter how hard they try to scroll. And that's two totally different opposite kind of mindset. So I'll try to not think about how many times. Mostly I just think about Is it an interesting content that I would like to talk about and my audience would like to hear about? If yes, then I just don't care if it is 10 or 2 or 1. I would just share it. There are days that I don't have much interesting stuff to share and that's also fine. Like People will understand it and it's totally normal to be absent one or two days. It's not like everybody going to forget you. So uh, <laughs> that's my principle. <laughs> I agree. And I think the reward is a great recognition. And also those engagement is a great recognition for a lot of the works that you care a lot about. And I think I would say is in two very important aspects, which is you care a lot about like the personal branding and the AI education. I suppose the question I have for you in this is that in general, do you feel that the analytic professional in the field that we are in somehow lagging behind when it comes to the personal branding. 100%, Jason. That's something that I have been observing for a very long time and they're starting to get more engaged. That's a good news. And I guess a lot of them get in touch with me and talk about my experience and they, they want to collaborate and that's That's amazing. I would love to collaborate with all of the thought leaders in the data science and AI and other industries. But they're starting and probably within last two years, it has been ramped up. But I still, I think this is a wrong belief that if you are an expert, your work should speak by itself and you don't need to sell it or talk about it. And if you are a thought leader, then You need to publish one book per year and that's how you can stay as a slot leader or publish one amazing article or paper in the best journal in the world and that's it. I mean, there are lots of different ways that people would like to show their work and let people know what they're doing for the community. But I guess in 2020 and 2021, it's a time that... We need to redefine the way we used to work. And social media is already a winner, has been there for a very long time. And if we don't join it and we don't share and collaborate, it will be our own individual that will be missing out. And, and unfortunately, we're all actually not letting the community to get, get to our amazing insights and stuff that we can share. And we'll hold it out up for ourselves rather than putting it out there. Some of us may think that LinkedIn is like a little bit dry. It's more of it is professional network that only should be used to find a job or share your resume or look for new opportunities whenever you're you want to join a new company. And that's also another huge mistake, which I think the thought leaders are kind of getting away from it 
but still there is a there are lots of things that we can do and we should do to become more current and active. I agree, Steve. Now, what would be your suggestion for the aspiring professional or the professional in the data science to be more visible in the industry and also building their personal brand? Yeah, so that's what I always talk about with my own students or interns that you need to come out of your shells. It's not about being expert first and then start engaging on social media. Social media is not designed for only influencers, the one that has this blue icon at the end of their name. So that's not only people available and those are not the only people that are there to share their insights. What I always encourage people, especially data scientists, to start sharing their journey whatever that can make a discussion and that can add a value. That's, that's the most important goal, right? Add value to your community because you will get something back out of that interaction. That's the two-way interaction. It's not a symmetric that will instantly give you a reward, but that is something that will accumulate and you can get the result sometime later, but this is definitive result. And it will happen. So what we need to do, we need to start thinking how we can easily add value. And for a person that is not a thought leader or an influencer, there are lots of different ways. If you're learning a new skill and you found a really good resource, that's a good way to start. Also, I guess sharing other people's posts, engaging with other people's posts. This is something that we are all missing here. I remember I posted, I think it was two years ago, my post was like, a lot of people believe that by interacting with one post, they're giving away medal of honor or some kind of accolade to the author or writer. So they're kind of reserving that like or thanks or I don't know, a comment. They're they're just hesitant to engage. And actually, this is something... I'm sometimes guilty of doing it. I sometimes check people's activities and then try to understand like how much that person is active and adding the value to the community because I would like to engage with people and I would like to understand more about the social media. So I can see some senior professionals and executives. It has been months that they hasn't been active or actively interacting with anyone. Like literally the last time they liked a post was like 12 months ago. And that was a post from their own colleague or somebody praising them in for some project. And that's it. And that's, that's the way they are interacting with the others. And this is not the best way to stay connected on social media and get some return. All right. So if you're beginning your journey, I would say, take time and put even some kind of milestones. For example, let's like 20 posts a day and let's comment five times a day. That's a milestone for you to start. There is no sharing in this. It's liking and post and commenting. No sharing a post, okay? So don't get scared about going out there and being exposed as not a a thought leader in the field. And that will be a good way to start. You will get a lot of visibility out of it. You never know how many people will see you because of your interesting comment under a very interesting, engaging post. And that's why some of these very, very intelligent marketing experts, they find these people with high engagement and they will like and comment within the first couple of minutes. They will actively do this. It's not something random that they are commenting on every interesting post. And it's like, ah, this guy is so genius. Uh, He just finds the right place, right time. No, no, that's not the case. They're actively monitoring the space. They understand these five, six, 10 people are super engaging, make super engaging content. And they wait for their post daily scrolling, clicking, checking their posts and see if there is anything new out. 
they would write something meaningful, interesting, and engaging under the post. And they get a lot of visibility, a lot of visibility by providing some value to that particular post. So that's also one way for people to get results. I guess that's the easiest. I agree. And especially in the B2B marketing space, I think people or even for someone who have a career as a data scientist, I think they don't necessarily come to fully grasp the idea that their needs to get themselves out there to be visible in the marketplace entirely. And the other thing I probably would equally add on to that is it is actually a good opportunity to practice without showing themselves 100% in, but practicing that whole public speaking skill, relationship building skill in terms of just by engaging, right? Yeah, totally. The softer skill is, I guess, the most important skill for a junior professional. I can testify if you come to me as an intern and you don't know much of the Python programming, yet you have all those softer skills that is needed, like problem solving, analytical thinking, and intelligence, and you know how to learn, and you're quick with it, the smart person, you are the best intern ever. I agree. Now, also in one of your posts, which I wholeheartedly agree with you, you mentioned that this equally applies to the senior professional. And you are suggesting that, which I observed that as well, is that a lot of them are becoming more active on LinkedIn. I think especially in the year 2020, I can see there are much more activity on their LinkedIn profile. Now, share with us about your observation and perhaps some tips for the listener who are the senior leader. I think one of the things that I noticed and I am sort of like putting myself in their shoes is who are the senior leader is that perhaps they have this concern of leaving the digital footprint on the internet and that could bite them <laughs> eventually. Yes. They... yes, always you. So that's, that's something to be fair and honest. I was a little bit concerned when I went on social media sharing my own insights, especially I started sharing my own insights a little bit later. So first I was only sharing interesting things from others and there was nothing added from me. So there was less harm done. But I started sharing my own insights when I had more than 100K followers. And then I was like, all right, so here we go. If something goes wrong, it will be seen by many, many people. So better make it right. And there was a lot of pressure. And I remember I learned a lot from those experiences because there will always be negativity. There will always be haters. Somebody will disagree with you. And some there will be trolls as well that they don't care whatever you talk about. They'll find something, a typo. There is something missing that they will kind of change the course of conversation to something meaningless. So I learned a lot from all those experiences. I learned a lot and I'm totally a different person right now through these experiences. And for senior professionals, I can just tell you that this is the reality. LinkedIn is becoming more and more like a um, social media network that people share content. And the trend kind of started after Microsoft buying LinkedIn. I think they put a lot of effort understanding how to engage more and how to make LinkedIn more sustainable and more profitable. And I guess one of the models was having more engagement, bringing more original content and shifting from kind of an online resume to interaction-based kind of platform. And then... They changed and modified their algorithms to incentivize activities and kind of the outreach is totally different on LinkedIn right now. You will get a lot of organic reach by sharing something interesting. It is not possible on Facebook or somehow Twitter to get the same kind of visibility super easily and win a lot. This has been something Gary Vee has been talking about so long time and a lot of other 
social media experts, whether you agree with them or not, they've been talking about it. And this is the reality. So I guess a lot of senior executives also sensing this opportunity and they know that this opportunity, this door is not going to stay open for a very long time. At some point, LinkedIn is going to start closing the organic reach and kind of make you to keep your followers and connections to those that you already know and very difficult to find more to incentivize their sales and premium sales and kind of those marketing services that they got, which is totally profitable for any platform. So right now, these experts are coming to LinkedIn and becoming more and more active, trying to blend in. Still, they sometimes lack the understanding of the platform and how to engage, how to get more kind of dialogue going. They sometimes are a little bit too serious for the platform because they think it's professional and they stay too serious and then they don't get a lot of engagement. So I guess my one tip for those people would be professional doesn't mean serious at all. And if you're just sharing these articles from Harvard Business Review and kind of that's it for you, it's, it's not going to give you much. You need to come out of your shell. You need to be more open and exposed if you want to have some kind of relation with your audience. You need to showcase your personality through some kind of sharing insights and having opinions, which is very difficult for some people to, to do that. Because when you, you are opinionated and you have an opinion, then there are people are, that are 100% agreeing with you and hundred some of them 100% disagree with you because you have a point and you're staying in your place. So then you will have these, these kind of disagreement and agreement at two sides. And that's not the best position for a lot of people. Versus if you embrace it on the social media and you accept it as one of the I guess one of the features of any social media that will allow people to disagree with you and and also they will criticize your opinions and give you some feedback that you might even learn from it, then that's a good way to start. A couple of things that I pick up from that view that you just shared, if that's okay, I want to highlight them. The very first quick one is that I think it's completely okay to have those trolls. I, I sometimes I have this theory, right? Is that the minute that you start having trolls is the minute that you are actually starting to get results. Because just like you say, and like, no matter what you do, there will always some people out there who want to get out your dream. And it is okay, completely okay, because you just have to start recognizing that that is a time that you actually start to get results now. So at that point of time, you should paddle harder and keep on going. So that is probably my advice to the comment that I would say. Other than that is the other one is, I think LinkedIn is yet to become and is not quite becoming the play to market yet. So pay to play, basically, for example, Facebook or Instagram, especially Instagram itself is very much already pay to play. I, unless you are paying to Mark Zuckerberg, otherwise your post will never be seen by by your follower. I think the last time I read the number is about 3%. I suspect it's much more lower now. Whereas on LinkedIn, it's so much easier to get more than 3%. In fact, it's just so much easier to get even 30% of the people seeing your comments. So it is a great place to be before you become the pay-to-play market yet. And if that's okay, finally, I think my observation also is on my last one is I, I, this is where I perhaps I want to get your view and I want to go a little bit deeper as well is that I think in the last, maybe before the last 20 years, to some extent, organization is very much faceless. I, you talk about company X, you see the logo of the company X and you know what the company X logo is. And hardly you can associate the face of a person 
attached to a company. But I think over the last 20 years, especially there are some really, really big personality and there are some really big icon people like, for example, Steve Jobs, you got the Elon Musk, where these people become so, they become actually the face and making the organization more human. Do you think the majority of the organization haven't quite caught on to putting that human side and putting the key person of the influence within the company to become the person of the organization. And hence, to some extent, it is still the re- part of the reason why they are lacking in pushing that forward. Yeah, this is something, I guess, a little bit new for organizations to think about having personalities out there apart from their CEO and actually being more engaged in having some kind of branding, personal branding for their advocates. So that's where evangelism comes to the play. And there's a kind of a classic way of evangelism that you pick one, someone that's already super famous and obvious and everybody heard about and put it as an evangelist. Then that's one way. The other is like some companies are actually getting some people that are more active on social media and becoming more active daily. And that's evangelism kind of, I guess, version two, where they have social media popularity and they have expertise. And by sharing those expertise through social media, they're pushing many things at the same time. And that's, for example, you will see Cassie Kozirko for Google, Chief Data Scientist Google, or Ali Miller from AWS or some other people in that kind of area that they, they're growing very big in the social media and that delivers huge amount of value to their companies. And that's a value added. And they, they will be known as experts slash evangelists. They're doing personal branding in the right way by some sort of educating the community, which is one way of making the interaction and relation with your audience. Now, on this note, I know that you have a social media course to help the data analytic professional to gain their visibility and to get better in terms of building their personal brand. Do you want to give a special mention about this? And also, I know you have that already released. Is that correct? Yes. So that's right. It is right now, actually, I don't want to sound too promotional, but it is right now on sales, still on, it is on pre-sales. It will be available around mid-December. And based on the time that you're watching this, it might be already released. So this particular course is very interesting and dear to my heart because this is purely my experience and experiments on social media leveraging my analytical skills and understanding only based on what I've observed rather than reading marketing books or kind of the, I guess, the classic way of understanding how these things work. So this course will help people to, I'll share my knowledge and they will be helped through the course to understand exactly what does personal branding mean in this current era and especially it's good for technical people who want to get some sort of uh, relationship with their audience by kind of showcasing their expertise it's again especially helpful for data scientists there's going to be some bonus tips and tricks for data scientists as well but general audience can get a lot of benefit as well because we will go through the fundamentals go through the fundamentals of what is LinkedIn, how does things work, some tips and tricks, some numbers, and just my own A-B testing and observation will be shared with people that hopefully they can leverage that and they can apply it to their own personal brand as well. I will have the link for this course to be shared in the blog post and also in the social media post. And for whoever is listening to this, I would highly encourage to take up the course. I think this is absolutely value for money. From what I know, what is available out there for the similar type of the course, the, the, what other people are charging is 
hundred times a lot more now. So please do yourself a favor. Um, don't be just a practical guy, but build your soft skill. Now continue on that journey. One of the really things that I found, and I so agree when I was doing the research to prepare for this interview is that you suggest that the personal branding, and also I know we have been talking a lot about social media, LinkedIn, but the reality is like you say, personal branding, networking, doesn't have to be just about posting or commenting on LinkedIn. And in fact, it can be built from the hackathon and the meetup group, which is actually how you get started, right? So how, in your own word, could you mind share with the listener how important some of these hackathon or the meetup group can play for their personal branding and networking and to build their career? That's right. Thanks, Jason, for touching on those points because these are also super important for a professional to kind of be engaged with different tasks, diversify their engagements across different branches. So when I was, I guess, maybe five or six years ago, when I was thinking about personal branding, and it was way before I was engaged on social media, I was thinking, how can I showcase my expertise and involvement with the community? That was the main goal. And just understanding where you can find some similar people with a similar mindset, a gathering for a good cause. That was the mission. And meetups and hackathons were kind of two of them that I targeted, participated in around 12 hackathons. And these days I'm kind of retired, but I'm still helping people to run hackathons and a mentor and organize international hackathons, global hackathons in different areas. And meetups also were a really, really good way to engage directly with people face-to-face, talk about something you're passionate about, and help people to learn something from you, which will help you to learn things better. That's a key point. Learn things by teaching them. If it is something technical and so complex and difficult, Make sure you can find someone and teach them that particular subject. In that way, you will force yourself to learn it in and out. And that was something that I did during my studies by being a peer mentor and peer tutor for some other students, teaching something that I learned literally in the previous semester that helped me to get more of in-depth understanding of those stuff that I've missed before during my studies and it applies for anything else so teaching is the best way of learning period meetups going to help you achieve that hackathons is another kind of way to get value in multiple different ways i remember by joining hackathons i was actually finding interesting people that have the drive have the passion to come to a competition during the weekend where usually people would like to go out and have fun having a beer with a friend and and you know in great sunny day in sydney you would like to be in the beach and do some sort of um, fun activities but you're kind of turning all down and for 48 hours you're going to be in front of your computer writing code brainstorming and solving some problem that you care about, that shows a lot of soft skills. That shows a lot of determination. That's the person that I would like to be friend with. And I actually found a lot of interesting people that I'm still friend with and they're super successful in their career. And we are still in touch or we've been working together for some time. And that's just only one tiny little outcome of a hackathon learning from your peers and from the senior people is another awesome thing that you will not get it in anywhere else like when you're a student you only have your peers you're learning together but when you go to a hackathon you sometimes get lucky you get someone it's like much more senior they know it they know how to do things In my first hackathon, I was a member of a very, very senior team. They were doctors and PhD students from Sydney Uni. 
and they were all accomplished statisticians and data scientists. And that was like, oh my God, it's like, there's a huge thing to learn. And then we had a lot of interesting conversations around tackling the challenges. And I learned a lot from these people. I think my contribution to that project was minimum just because all these amazing people were involved. But for me, I tried to be the sponge and learn as much as possible. And then finally, winning the hackathon will kind of give you one extra accolade for your resume, some cash for your account. What can be better than this? Hey, y'all, I just want to give a quick shout out about this episode. It's sponsored by the Embedded Analytic Program at DDA. And the Embedded Analytic Program is designed for senior manager and executive in the business team who want to integrate data science into daily business operation and use it to drive customer experience excellence and revenue. And book unlimited strategy session for a full year and start embedding analytics into the business front line. For more information about this program, please refer to the description of this episode. Now let's get on back to the interview. Exactly, as something to talk about during the uh, job interview as well. Speaking of Hackathon, I believe you have one coming out in July 2021, and it's called Global AI. Is that something that you and ACS are planning? Would you mind to share with us a little bit more about this? Yes, so the annual Global AI Hackathon is, I guess, our flagship event. We had the first one this year in July, 2020. And during that event, first of all, it was a huge success. Around 4,000 people from all over the world were participating in this amazing hackathon. And, and that's just like beyond imagination, like 4,000 people on a Slack group, they're just sending and commenting and messaging each other. And we had these different spaces for different topics. Some people were looking for a team. Some people were looking for a member for their team and resources and a water cooler kind of conversations that was full of memes and funny stuff. And that's like a very quick way to get together, to learn and to communicate and to work together, which is awesome to watch. I was just sort of an organizer and I was super excited and Every time I was logged into this Slack group, I got motivated and inspired by these people. That event was sponsored by Google, Amazon, AWS, Oracle, IBM, and a couple of other great brands. And we had also some amazing influencers as a judge and speaker. Cassie Kozirkov was our lead judge and the speaker for the award ceremony. And many other, my friends, were part of the judging group, which was a team of kind of superstars. For next year, we are planning to have the same kind of event. Hopefully, it will get bigger, better, and more interesting. Still, we have some time to get there, but that's a huge opportunity for all the data scientists, AI enthusiasts in the world. Keep an eye on the space and make sure you, you just somehow find a team or work individually to get some interesting solutions submitted for the hackathon. We also managed to organize another hackathon two weeks ago. It was called Cybersecurity Hackathon. It was the APAC region only, but it was also hugely successful, more than 2,000 people. And we all know cybersecurity is a niche area and we don't have kind of that many technicals around the world to as much as you will see in data science, but still we captured around 2000 participants only in the APAC region. Hopefully the results in the award ceremony will be soon. I guess it's 6th of December. The award ceremony will be in the 6th of December. Super excited to see who are the winners. I think that 4,000 numbers for the year July 2020 is huge and the efforts of going into organizing those things could be crazy. Now, I know you set a really, really high number for yourself, a really high target for yourself for the 2021. Do you want to share with us with that number? <laughs> we would like to have 10,000 people. 
in the Slack group as the participants, mentor, and in general, involved with this hackathon. So 10,000 is a number that we are looking for. It's a big number, but we think we can achieve that. 10,000 into Slack. Now that is a crazy number. Slack, if you are listening, please, please become the one of the sponsor because Steve is bringing 10,000 traffic to using Slack. Now let's get a look into your main professional focus. Could you please tell us a bit more about Australia Computer Society and your role as the head of data science? Yeah, so Australian Computer Society is a peak industry body representing IT and ICT professionals in Australia. And by that, it means that they have monopoly over many services like accrediting university courses, assessing professionals, those that are going to immigrate to Australia or internally, they want to get certified as a professional. We run many events and we also collaborate with government on policy making, decision making, and we also generate frameworks for professionals about data sharing, data privacy, and many other IT related frameworks. There are other events that will help professionals to be more successful in the career. It can be uh, upskilling workshops, learning, networking, and somehow bringing together the community. So my role as a head of data, so I have two hats at ACS. As a head of data science, it's an internal role looking into data analytics, taking over data analytics, data governance for ACS as a company, as an organization, which has around 50,000 members. And these 50,000 members will interact with many things, with events and online assets and understanding these trends and getting a better view of our customer is a key for ACS. At the same time, head of AI community development in Australia, which is an kind of an evangelist role. And for this role, I need to think about the community. How can I help the community to work together, like kind of building the ecosystem? It's an interesting one because I get to go around the Australia. I mean, like before COVID, going around Australia, talking to people directly, running workshops and participating in kind of different events. The major goal for that role will be helping these people to understand the importance of AI and data science and also bringing more of the learning material and opportunities to them. And I think this is one of your, the educating people about the AI is clearly one of the role that you play and also the passion. And I think it is great that you guys are doing that. I suppose, apart from running those events, it is so great that you guys are helping to upskilling and preparing the current and the future workforce in the data science. And I suppose the question for you is then, do you think we are ready? And do you think we have done enough to be building up that workforce that is ready, who need to take on the challenges of the AI and the data science that will be required of them? I guess we are far from being ready, to be very honest. That's the reality of your working towards that. Within the couple of months that I've been in this role, I have tried my best to get connected more and more with people and make the awareness, make the connections happening. But still, we have been a bit unfortunate with many incidents, including COVID which slowed down the whole economy and also events has been hit very hard by this particular situation. It will be ramped up. We have great initiatives coming up. One of them will be an AI community platform will be launched for Australia very soon. I'm going to still keep the momentum because it's, it hasn't been kind of published publicly anywhere. So it will soon be announced. The 
the platform will be ready and that will kind of be some kind of online platform that will help drive the community more effectively and it will definitely will not be hit by any pandemic so we can always make sure that the relation and collaboration is happening smoothly for the organization that want to be future proof and start in investing in ai what would be your advice for them in terms of upskilling their workforce? Yeah, so one of the major skills, I guess, for anyone who wants to stay relevant for 2021 onward is learning how to learn. That's something probably new for people, but that's the reality because things are changing super quickly. And without having the mindset, lifelong learning mindset, we will be disrupted very easily in this era. And if you think about it, in data science and AI, every day when you wake up, you will see a new tool or library or platform has been launched. And by the time that you look on Google for some good resources, you will see hundreds of resources available for each one of them. So how can you learn all these platforms and how can you pick the best way to learn them? That's going to be the challenge of people in the next era, being super flooded with noise and lots of opportunities to learn, but kind of having a fatigue and not understanding how to move forward. So for any company that are thinking how to overcome this problem, they need to change the culture and the mindset of people to understand how to better devote their time into upskilling in the right direction. And they can be like these companies can be catalysts and can think about the better ways that they can leverage their money and time to bring the best resources for their own employees. And it can be through brown bags, it can be through some workshops, specific workshops run by thought leaders that is free and available for employees, or it can be some paid kind of opportunities that employees can pick their own way of learning because people are also different from each other, right? I might prefer books, you might prefer blogs, and somebody might prefer YouTube. And that's just the reality of these days. People are different and they have different preference of learning. So I guess in the nutshell, it's just uh, making sure that they change the culture and they develop the soft skills of lifelong learning and they devote some time for their employees to upskill and stay relevant and current. I'm going to come back to that one later and go a little bit details. But before that, I want to ask you if that is if the organization are interested to engage you or ACS in running workshop, especially for the employee, what is the best way for them to engage you and ACS? So ACS has uh, different functions and one of them is the education function, which is doing workshops and the, running these kind of events for partners or companies that are kind of collaborating with ACS so they can easily contact the the education team or they can contact me directly if it is relevant to AI and data science and we can think about how we can collaborate because sometimes we even tap into our members for workshops or even a third party kind of organizations will run some workshops. So it's not always ACS making content internally we usually will kind of interact and liaise others to be more active and they would provide the content for acs and acs will be the publisher for it so there are kind of different way to do it but it's based on the case we would love to hear if anybody's interested in collaboration absolutely so early on we talked a little bit about the upskilling the workforce and also this education now I know that in the early part of the conversation, you mentioned that ACS also is involved in the policy making with the government. I suppose my question for you is that 
in some countries like Israel, the government is actually investing a lot to help stir the development of the AI as a sector in the global present because they want to make sure they're staying at the forefront. In your view, what role can the Australian government play in this space? Yeah, you're right. I, I mean, I do believe that Australia as a country is a little bit behind the competition in the world. And that's not only, I guess, the government, also the mindset is a little bit conservative, like investment mi- mindset is a little bit conservative. And that will not allow risk to be kind of distributed among the stronger kind of entities like government and investors and that will be more towards the entrepreneurs and they should take care of most of the risk which will kind of demoralize people to jump out to do something outside the box and it will more incentivize the people that just following the norms especially the corporates that are already pretty much set and they're delivering some services in a classic way. So I would say there's a lot of work to be done in that regard. The R&D tax was a really good initiative forward. It's an old one, but it had some kind of uh, bumpy road, kind of went backward at some point. And we hope that it will be helpful in, in the next year. There are lots of different grants, the AC grant and the MVP grant. They are all targeting different stage of the startups. But I guess there are still like more from the public sector and the government to play in this regard. And especially the investment, if you look at the the numbers, it is not even close to top performers in the world. And if you think about, I guess all those different positive kind of incentives that you can get in US or Israel, it will make it very difficult for Australia to stay competitive and to attract more of the smart people, smart entrepreneurs with great ideas. Even some of them that will come up with something interesting, they will migrate to other countries to to expand and to get more of all those benefits. But it is it is a fundamental thing that we need to work. There are lots of good initiatives happening in in Australia in general, like AI hubs and government initiatives, the skills organization and CSIRO also doing a lot of work in helping deep tech specifically. And some of the venture capitals are becoming more aware of deep tech and in investing in something that will have some kind of with a growth mindset and some kind of long-term return. But specifically, I would say it's a little bit of culture shift that we need to think about. I think I could still hear quite a bit of uh, good news in there. And I think it looks like we are progressing further. So that is great. Now, this brings us almost to the end of these conversation slash interview. These are the two questions that I always ask my guests. Number one is, what is your most important first principle? Um, That's a very deep one. I guess adding value first, that's the most significant first principle that will have a great kind of return in my life. And I have received a lot of great outcomes out of just delivering value without expecting. And that's why it is a drive for whatever I do. Always, I'll think about that as the most important, I guess, first principles. And also the other one is, I guess you asked for one, but I would say I have pretty much two that are, both of them are very important at the same time. The other one is just question everything like question everything that you might think it's fixed or it is assumed. There shouldn't be much assumptions. And by questioning everything, you might find better ways of doing it, better results, better way going around it. And don't just 
conform just because many people are doing it. So I agree. And uh, a lot of time people are rewarded by willing to question the things that seems to be the norm and that is proven in the history again and again. Now, my final question for you is, what is one book that you have read and thought it would have been better for your younger self to have? I guess there has been a lot of them. And you, when you say one, it just uh, makes it very difficult because then I need to just in my brain tell the others why you're not being picked as the winner. So if I want to choose one of them, The Art of a Start by Guy Kawasaki was one of the books that I really wanted to read and learn when I was very young and wanted to be entrepreneur. Like around 20 years ago, I wish I had it. I had that. And that kind of teach you the mindset of being entrepreneur and how to, for example, how to risk more and don't be afraid of failures or all these things that we, we want to understand as a person who wants to start a risky business or start a new project with a lot of unknowns. And that was something I have been struggling when I was very young, very, I guess, afraid of making any mistakes and doing any risk. And I guess that's something that would have impacted my life probably a lot when I could have that mindset developed for me uh, at early age stage of my career. I think that is probably one book that I would still love to read and I want to read. I think I can relate so much to that in starting business or new project, etc. There is always that all of these risks involved. I think that is a great book. I would actually pick it up myself. Now, thank you so much, Steve, for coming on to the show. I uh, want you to know that I really appreciate that, but uh, also for sharing a lot of wisdom with the listener in terms of the personal branding, uh, education in the AI and how do we can build up the workforce that is future proof. So thank you so much. Thanks, Jason. It was a pleasure and I enjoyed the talk a lot. Hello. If you enjoyed this conversation, hit that subscribe button so we can meet again. If you don't, I'll be stuck in an infinite loop. So pull that part by clicking the subscribe and help me out. You can further support us by leaving us a kind review from wherever you are listening. At the end of the year, I will choose a reviewer to send a special gift to, and it might just be you. I look forward to seeing you here next week for a new adventure. If I can find my way out of this endless loop. See ya!